from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the Library of Congress. We just have a, my name is Jason Steinhauer, and I'm a program specialist for the John W. Kluge Center in the Office of Scholarly Programs here. Uh, really great to see you all today. Today's lecture is going to be fascinating, and uh, look forward to uh, sharing more of these events with you in the coming weeks and months. Uh, we have scholars here at the Kluge Center that come in year round and use the library's collections to do research and then present that research and engage with the public, with members of Congress and policymakers on topics of interest, um, of global significance. And so we encourage you to please stay in touch with us. We have an RSS feed sign up list in the back. So if you want to learn more about future events and future lectures, please sign that list. Uh, that way we can send you notifications when we have uh, future programs that might be of interest to you. Once again, that's in the back. We also have pamphlets in the back that tell you more about the center. And if you go to our website, we have more information about the different fellowships and scholars that are here with us, and also some more links to events, news, Kluge Prize, and other information. So please do keep in touch, and we hope to see you back here again very soon. Now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mary Lou Rieker to start today's program. Hello, um, my name is Mary Lou Rieker, and on behalf of the Library's Office of Scholarly Programs and the John W. Kluge Center, I welcome you to a talk by Dr. Peter Wien entitled, From the Glory of Conquest to Paradise Lost, Al Andalus in Historical Consciousness. So I want to ask you to please make sure your phones are off so uh, there's no extraneous sounds during the lecture. And of course, to thank the John W. Kluge family for their support of all our programs. Dr. Peter Wien received his PhD in Islamic studies in 2003 from the University of Bonn in Germany, and his master's degree in 2000 from the University of Oxford in Great Britain. Dr. Wien is an associate professor of Middle Eastern history at the University of Maryland in College Park. And previously, he taught at Al Aqawain University in Ifran, Morocco, and was a fellow of the Center for Modern Oriental Studies in Berlin. In 2006, Rutledge Press published his book, Iraq Arab Nationalism Authoritarian, Totalitarian, and pro-fascist inclinations, 1932 to 1941. And his articles have appeared in various international journals concerning modern history and Middle Eastern studies. Dr. Wien's research interests are in the role of cultures of nationalism and religion in the transformation of modern Arab states and societies. And as a Kluge Fellow, he's been working on a cultural history of Arab nationalism during the late 19th and 20th centuries. Please help me welcome him today, Dr. Peter Wien. All right, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming out here today. Um, I'm slightly nervous about this talk because it's the first time that I'm presenting this topic in a, in a public venue like this, so I stand here to be corrected um, if there are any things that are not sound um, at, at this point here especially because I think there might also be a few Hispanists in this room, which I am not. Um, but uh, let me start by thanking, first of all, the uh, Kluge Center for giving me the opportunity in the past half year or so to work here on uh, a book um, project uh, especially I would like to thank um, Mary Lou, Mary Lou Recker, who just um, was, was here at this uh, pulpit, and also the director of the center, um, Caroline Brown, but of course also my uh, fellow fellows um, at the Kluge Center, which, with whom I had very lively discussions. I would also like to thank the um, uh, 
uh, librarians and the uh, staff of the um, African and Middle East Division Reading Room here at the Library of Congress for not only half year but many years of support in this wonderful institution. I think it's a unique collection um, in, the, in the reading room. And uh, last but not least, I would like to thank my intern and research assistant, um, uh, Basil Bastaki, who's sitting over here for um, his invaluable support uh, during my research here. So uh, what I'm presenting today is basically a chapter of a book uh, that I'm writing, and uh, the title of this book will be Arab Nationalism, um, the Politics of History and Culture in the Modern Middle East, which is a presentation of cultural manifestations of Arab nationalism. Um, so, let me go right into the topic that is still here, so I, have to, I should take it away. I hope this helps. No, it doesn't. Okay. All right. Good. No, not here yet. Okay. Al-Andalus is a geographic name and a historical location. It is the Arab, Arabic reference to present-day Andalusia as a political subdivision of the Kingdom of Spain, but it is also the name that Arabs gave to the Iberian Peninsula during the period of Muslim Spanish rule from 711 to 1492 of the Common Era. And I should say that all the dates that I'm giving in this talk are according to the Common Era. Al-Andalus is, however, also an imaginary space, a reference in collective memory in a great number of cultural contexts, ranging from references in Western poetry, opera, and film, um, over Arab literary and uh, musical genres to, unfortunately, also references in the diatribes of present-day um, Islamist terrorists. In the eyes of many, it is a symbol for magnificent and opulent culture, fine architectural achievements, lush gardens, and grand intellectual achievement. And the term convivencia is, is a synonym for a cultural and uh, for a culture of fruitful coexistence and cooperation between Muslims, Christians, and Jews in medieval Al-Andalus, which has become a topos of nostalgic reference to the potentials of religious tolerance among promoters of dialogue between uh, the three religions with a healthy dose of Orientalist imagination and kitsch. Radical voices, however, also claim their share in the Al-Andalus Al myth. After the 2003 terror attacks in Madrid, Spanish Prime Minister Aznar evoked historical memory of Spanish resistance against the Muslim conquest in 711, turning the country rhetor rhetorically into a battleground in the clash of civilizations. For Muslim fanatics, on the other hand, the Reconquista of Spain for Christian rule, completed in 1492, remains a powerful symbol in propaganda calling for a rollback of Christian rule in order to achieve ultimate victory for fundamentalist Islam. Al-Andalus has diverse meanings as a topos in a translocal Arab identity based on cultural memory. I explore two trajectories um, of this cultural meaning in my inquiry. The one, the first one, is the glory of conquest, which is an analysis of the perseverance of a particular literary topos in Arabic literature. And the second is the permanent exile from the lost paradise, which looks at Arabic literature as a depository of nostalgic references reaching back to the glory days of Arab Muslim civilization in Al-Andalus. Nostalgia takes on its literal meaning in this context, the Greek term nostalgia, which is homesickness. The longing for the deserted motherland. Its commemoration constitutes a shared Arab cultural heritage evoking two principal emotions, pride and longing, that are at the heart of an invention of tradition. So for the sake of a stringent narrative here, I reverse the order of these two um, trajectories. I speak first about paradise lost and then about the glory of conquest, and you'll find out later on why that makes sense. Plus, you know, this... Um, um, inquiry leaves out one or another crucial um, element of um, Al-Andalus as a realm of memory, which is music, Andalusian music, which is something that would be an entirely different talk, which I cannot uh, cover here. References to paradise were common in the context of Al-Andalus. In 1936, the eminent Arab nationalist and transcultural intellectual Shakib Arslan 
who lived from 1869 to 1946, published a book based on his experiences during a journey in Spain that he undertook around 1930. The title of the book is here on the slide. He characterized the book in its subtitle as an Andalusian encyclopedia, which encloses everything that came off this lost paradise. Arslan was an influential politician and an accomplished poet before World War I, but spent most of the interwar period as a political exile in Geneva, where he became a self-declared representative of the Arab nationalist cause at the League of Nations and an influential voice in Arab nationalist discourse throughout the Arab world. His book, Al-Hulal al-Sundusiya, has received little attention among his works. It was published in Cairo from 1936 to 1939 in three volumes. In volume three, Arslan um, laid out his plan to publish up to 10 volumes altogether that were to cover his, his own impressions during his journey um, in Spain, combined with reports about Arab scholars who emerged from the places, who had emerged from uh, the places he visited uh, during the period of Muslim rule, and two in subsequent volumes, um, the history of Islamic Spain from the conquest to the Reconquista, concluding the history of the Moriscos. It was a peculiar approach that he took and one that Arslan shared with, with other um, Arab Muslim travelers in Spain that had preceded him or followed him. So the, the approach to evaluate the country in a nostalgic manner with little regard to the post-Muslim period. Arslan takes his readers on a tour of collective imagination. A photo adorns page one of volume one of the book. And this, po uh, this photo is here on the slide. And the caption reads, image of the author in front of the mosque of Cordoba. Arslan sits in front of the, char of the characteristic forest of columns that makes the Mesquita and Cordoba, Cordoba a monument of world heritage today. His posture, the clothes he wore, and the accessories that are visible form a quite eclectic ensemble. Altogether, they represent a vague orientalness. The turban, the robe, the leisure of a tea ceremony, um, but all these elements are not part of an identifi identifiable uh, regional um, national style. Let's have a closer look at the background of the image. Arslan seems to be posing as an Arab inside the mesquita. But should the wording of the caption then not be inside the mosque of Cordoba. So instead of Amama in front of Fidachil inside the mosque of Cordoba. The background, while perfectly exact in terms of perspective and vanishing point, has a certain artificial flatness to it, as if painted. A comparison with the actual architecture of the mesquita, which you can see a few um, impressions of it here, um, reveals that the axis of the gaze of the camera in the photo would have produced an unobstructed view through a straight line of arches instead of what actually we can actually see on, um, on the photo here. Um, so because the columns um, in the mesquita actually stand in line and are not staggered as the photo suggests. The astounding visual um, impression of standing in a forest of columns only comes about when the onlooker views the columns at an angle. Moreover, the only place where the particular shape of the columns that we see on the photo can be found in the Mesquita is uh, the entrance to the uh, Capilla Villa Viciosa, which is close to the um, old mihrab um, of the mosque. Um, this um, Capilla, however, which we can see um, an image of here, um, has steps that lead to the entrance, or if the um, angle uh, of view would be reversed, we would see something um, like a, a, a view that we, see, that we have here on the bottom, you know, a view towards the Mihra. So what comes out of this is that the particular perspective of Arslan's photo is impossible in the Mesquita. And therefore, the picture must have been taken in a photo studio of the kind that is popular in many tourist locations internationally where photographers offer to take pictures in period costumes in front of a historical backdrop of choice. Like, for instance, an American visitor to colonial Williamsburg uh, would have taken a picture of himself um, with, a, in, with a wig and a frock coat uh, to capture an image uh, for a nostalgic identification with national history. For Arslan, placing himself in an artificial oriental setting meant that he, the oriental, created his own orientalist Arab Andalusian imaginary. Images in Geneva show Arslan normally in suit and tie as a respectable spokesperson of Arab modernity. 
The fact that he submitted himself to the rules of the paradigmatic Western gaze as a stereotypical Arab was evidently not a mere hoax for Arslan, the tourist, but he chose it to introduce, he chose it on purpose to introduce his voluminous homage to Al-Andalus as the lost paradise of the Arabs. The choice, um, it was however his choice as well not to reveal to his Arab readers that the setting of this picture was fake which throws light on the entanglement between the authenticity of the place, the Mesquita and Cordoba, its position in a historical narrative, and its central position in an identity-shaping imaginary. Arslan's Al-Andalus was as rightfully claimed by Arabs as part of a common heritage as it was invented by European Orientalist poets and scholars, and both uh, perspectives are intertwined. References to Al-Andalus were also statements the competition between East and West. In 1913, the eminent Egyptian poet Ahmad Shawqi, and I will say more about him later, wrote a poem, poem on the occasion of the fall of Edirne, ancient Adrianople, to Bulgarian troops in 1913 during the First Balkan War, which he called, the poem, uh, which he called Al-Andalus Al-Jadida, the new Al-Andalus. And I have to say that uh, in order to understand this, uh, understand this we, uh, we have to be aware that Shawqi at the time before World War I was an Ottoman patriot influenced by the Arab cultural revival of his time. He promoted Muslim unity, but with a strong Arab cultural reference. And this was quite a widespread um, a stance among Arab intellectuals at the time. For Shauki, Edirne was the new Andalus because of the role it had played in the history of the Ottoman Empire as a short-lived capital from, from 1413 until 1458 on European ground and as a burial place for a number of Ottoman sultans. For Shauti, Edirne was the new Andalus because its fall was a repetition of the fall of Granada. Address, addressing a perso personified Edirne, Shauki lamented in the first stanza of his poem, O sister of Andalus, Peace be with you. The caliphate has fallen from you, and so has Islam. The crescent fell from the sky. Two wounds continue to bear down the two motherlands. In a footnote to this poem, the editor of this poem explained that Edirne and Al-Andalus were the two wounds, and the motherlands were those of the Arabs and the Turks combined under Ottoman rule. I move now uh, to... Um, the first major part of my talk, which is about Arab travelers in Spain. So this, I have a map here. Um, it represents uh, Spain in the year 1030 during the period of the rule of the Taifa um, kings in Muslim Spain. After the fall of Granada in 1492 and the expulsion of the Moriscos from Spain in 1609, there were only few Muslims who set, who had, who set foot on the Iberian Peninsula. Knowledge of Al-Andalus survived as historiography, such as that of the great historian of Muslim Spain, Ahmad ibn Muhammad al-Maqari, um, whose Naf Atib min Ghuzn al-Andalus ar atib his major work, is one of the major Arabic sources um, about the country during the Muslim period because its author compiled a vast amount of information taken from texts that in many cases are no longer extant today. The Reconquista cut the physical bond between the Iberian Peninsula and the rest of the Muslim world. Muslims who traveled um, to Spain up to the 19th century um, traveled to enemy territory. And those who left written records of their journeys were generally either Moroccan or Ottoman ambassadors. Records of such travels reveal little to nothing in terms of identification with Spain as a cultural realm. Visitors exhibited a lofty disdain for Christians and abhorred the perceived desecration of former Muslim places of worship, like the Mesquita of Cordoba. New perceptions emerged in the late 19th century in the context of the Arab cultural arrival, the so-called Nahda. And this was a move to cultural identification. The Egyptian intellectual Ahmad Zaki embarked on a journey to Spain from late 1892 to early 1893. 1893. His trip resulted in a change of paradigm in the Arab reception of Al-Andalus. Zaki was a literary figure, a bibliophile, and Egyptian government official, as well as a confidant of Khedif Abbas II, the Egyptian monarch who sponsored the journey. He played a leading role in the publications of classical Arabic texts in Egypt. Zaki was the first to publicize his travelogue 
in a grand framework, at first in the Egyptian daily Al-Ahram, and then um, as a widely read book. He was also the first to depart from the broad Muslim point of view, moving to an Arab-Egyptian one. His actual destination of his trip was London to participate in the Ninth Orientalist Congress, but he dedicated almost three months of his journey to the Iberian Peninsula. In his report about the journey, Zaki addressed his readers no longer as co-religionists, as others had done, but as compatriots. For Zaki, Egypt and Al-Andalus were inseparably linked through civilization. He once referred to Iberia as the second Arabian Peninsula. His references to the past were no longer about religion, but about ethnic identity and civilization. Science was a lead topic of his thought, and Spain in this context represented the past glory of Arab science. Zaki reported about Spain through a prism, to the effect that he hardly took notice of the post-Reconquista achievements of Spanish cult culture. Visiting monuments of Spain's heritage, such as cathedrals and museums on the trip, he only noticed the remnants of an Arab past, but refused to take in the beauty of the monuments as a whole. Al-Maqari's Naf Atib was his travel companion, yet Zaki's account established an original paradigm for the historical narrative that all following Arab travelers used and referred to in their travel logs. He denounced the intolerance of the Christian rulers of, after the Reconquista, writing that Muslims had respected religion, law, and prosperity of the people after their initial conquest. But he also wrote about the modern Spaniards who received him with great warmth and hospitality. But they, he also wrote that they retained many institutions, but also numerous traits of the Arab character, such as dignity, hospitality, and faithfulness. As for all other Arab travelers, um, travelers that I have used in my research, the climax of Saki's experience in Spain was his visit to the Mesquita in Cordoba. Like for most others, it was a place that perplexed and confused him. Zaki remarked that he could not imagine any place of worship of whatever religion being a more perfect rendering of human religious humility. In contrast to earlier Muslim visitors, he viewed the Mesquita as a Muslim space. He, he did not, uh, or let me start the sentence again. In contrast to earlier Muslim visitors who viewed um, the Mesquita as a Muslim space maculated by the Christian takeover, Zaki detached it from its mere function as a mosque and viewed it as Islam's contribution to world civilization. And the fact that the mosque had been turned into a cathedral was worth a half sentence to him only. And he remarked that it had not altered its general char characteristic. Zaki, in his uh, report, made a clear distinction between Arab and Spanish civilization. He didn't even mention the Berbers in his, um, in, in his book. Um, he ignored that Muslim rule in Spain had created a very hybrid culture, in fact. So, but by ignoring this, um, he made it easy for Arab travelers that follow him to claim Andalusian, civil, Andalusian civilization for themselves as an Arab civilization, instead of accept, accepting it as something peculiar in its own sense. Zaki's account clearly left an impression among his contemporaries. It was praised in the press and published in various editions. But on all accounts, the most prominent and most influential visit to Spain was that of Ahmad Shawqi, Egypt's prince of poets. Shawqi had been court poet for two Egyptian monarchs, um, the Khadivs Tawfiq and Abbas, up till 1914. After the latter's forced abdic abdication at the outbreak of World War I, and after publishing a poem criticizing the British, um, the British advised Chauki to seek exile in a neutral country. He opted for Spain for no other reason but the fact that Barcelona, where he spent the greater part of his exile from 1915 to 1919, was the major Mediterranean port of the country and therefore offered quick access to an eventual passage back home. Al-Andalus had not been a prominent topic of, Shauk of Shauki's panegyric poetry prior to his exile. A rare, if not the only occurrence, is the Edirne poem that I quoted above. Shauki had been an Ottoman patriot above all else before his Spanish exile. But his stay and the trip he undertook to Andalusia in late 1918 changed Shauki's vision of the country and his general intellectual trajectory. Today, Shauki's work is considered crucial in bringing about the Al-Andalus revival in Arab culture, not least because he was instrumental in the revival of medieval Andalusian poetic forms for neoclassical Arabic poetry. In Spain, he started to copy and to borrow rhyme schemes and meter um, from classical Andalusian poetry, thus foreshadowing a romantic reconstruction of an ancient literary 
Al-Andalus. This reconstruction reached its fulfillment in his long poem, Arehla il Al-Andalus, um, The Journey to Al-Andalus, which combines a description of his longing for Egypt with an account of his trip to Al-Andalus. He explained in the introduction to his poem um, that he traveled to Al-Andalus in two modes, like a visitor who strolled from monument to monument in awe, but also with poets of medieval Al-Andalus in his company. Schauke's descriptions of the monuments he saw, in particular the Mesquita and the Alhambra, present the author in a dreamlike state, evoking the times of Andalusian splendor. In one verse, for example, he alluded to an adorned case in the famous prayer niche, the mihrab um, of the Mesquita, that according to legend enshrined several pages of a Quran handwritten by the third caliph, Uthman. Shauqi wrote, the place of the book emits for you a perfume of rose, though it is empty, and you draw close to touch. His approach was different than that of previous visitors. He had no concern for the present day or the perceived desecration of the place by Christians, but he reinvented them as vehicles for his imagination, informed by his readings on Islamic history and literature, invoking a deep melancholy over times past. The last verse of the poem is a summary lesson addressing Shauqi's fellow Egyptians. If you have lost regard for the past, then you are lost to consolation. Shauqi's poems were crucial in triggering a broad interest in a distinctively Arab Andalusian past as living history. They've become part of the repertoire of motifs that poets and novelists would use up until today. And most importantly, they've become part of school curricula throughout the Arab world, and many of his poems actually have been turned into song, popular song. For Shauqi himself, they were a vehicle to express the pain of exile and the longing for a better place, either in a different location or in a different era. Above all, the reinvention of Al-Andalus um, as a lost paradise was a means to create a chronolo chronological trajectory of eternity. Visions of paradise always imply loss and eviction too, but they also refer to um, a longing for the return to paradise, and therefore are a promise of redemption and reinstallation into former grandeur. Al-Andalus thus establishes a reverse chronological order. Eviction from paradise is the end of the story and at the same time the, the beginning of a permanent exile, setting the stage for the current state of longing and nostalgia. To create the new Al-Andalus, and for most Arabs except some fanatics, um, this can only be an imaginary Al-Andalus, Arabs would have to follow a reverse route back to the beginnings in the glory of conquest. Shauki inserted this message of hope for restitution of strength and superiority in his aforementioned Edirne poem in the following verse. Time poses to you a standpoint like the one that Tariq took. Desperation is in the back and hope is before you. Patience and fearlessness were in him and they became deadly weapons, but even deadlier is not to have them. This verse is a reference to the legendary speech that Tariq ibn Ziyad gave after he led an Arab Berber army across the Straits of Gibraltar in 711, before he defeated King Roderick, the last king of Visigothic Spain in the Battle of Guadalete. The speech is one of the most prominent textual vestiges of the early Islamic conquests. According to a widely accepted tradition, Tariq um, ordered to burn the ships that the Muslim army had used to cross the straits to show his soldiers that the decision for conquest and battle was irreversible and retreat was no option. The original line, according to Al-Maqari, was, O oh people, where is the escape? The sea is behind you and the enemy before you, and by God, you have nothing left but confidence and patience. Shauqi's verses therefore not only alluded to a popular historical account, but also to the motifs of patience and self-assertion as crucial virtues in the face of overwhelming enemy force. The historical record of the Muslim conquest of Spain is complex. The first Arab accounts which are extant date to the 9th century. There is considerable controversy as to the details of Tariq's biography and the actual circumstances of his conquest. 
The question, notwithstanding if the story is myth or fact, Tariq ibn Ziyad's speech after burning the ships is a mainstay of not only Arab, but generally Muslim belligerent rhetoric until today. It features, almost, it features almost identically in all modern Arab versions of the story of the conquest. References to Tariq's speech, and in particular, the quote of interest, appear early in the Arabic tradition. Today, Tariq's speech has become a central ele element of modern fictional renderings of the conquest of Al-Andalus story. It appeared in a play that the poet Fuad al-Khatib published in 1931 in Amman under the title Fatah al-Andalus, the conquest of Al-Andalus. Um, Khatib um, was a prominent neoclassicist poet and Arab nationalist politician at his time, but today he's largely forgotten. The reason why I um, mention him here is that he plays um, an important role in my book altogether. Um, not only Al-Khatib's usage of rhyme and meter demanded certain adaptations of the original version of the speech, but there are also modifications owed to the author's Arab nationalist agenda. Al-Khatib sidestepped the problem of the Berber ethnicity of Tariq soldiers and Tariq himself by simply turning them into Arabs. The line, O oh people, where is the escape, becomes in Al-Khatib's rendering, where, O oh you, my people, is the escape. And the term he uses for my people is Arabic qawmi. The audience of Al-Khatib's play would have unmistakably interpreted this term in a nationalist sense as meaning my nation according to customary usage at the time. The speech is given at a crucial moment um, of the play, right after Tariq and his army enter the scene and right before the, statel, the, start, the start of the battle, the denouement of the entire play. The line is therefore a rallying call, and Al-Khatib put the answer that he would have deemed appropriate into the enthusiastic reply of Tariq's army on stage. Here we are, we Arabs. We are the swords that trim. It therefore seems peculiar that Al-Khatib assigned plenty of room in his play to non-Arab, Visigothic characters, in spite of his own Arab nationalist inclination and the role that the Al-Andalus myth played as a signifier for nostalgic feelings of past Arab glory. Two of these characters are Count Julian, a nobleman and vice-regent of the North African enclave Septa, modern-day Spanish Ceuta, and his daughter Florinda, by these names. Count Julian plays an important role in the Arab historiographical tradition about the conquest of Al-Andalus because he is said to be, one, to be the one who provided the ships for the passage of Tariq's army to cross the Straits of Gibraltar. He makes an appearance in the early, early chronicle by Ibn Abd al-Hakam, um, which is also the first extant record, re record of a topos of abuse, treason, and revenge in the story of the conquest of Al-Andalus that, that has come to play a central role in various traditions. The topos revolves around Count Julian, who is called Julian in Ibn Abd al-Hakam's account, and, he, and is the, the headman of Septa and um, vassal of King Roderick, who in Arabic is called Ludriq, um, um, who resided in Toledo. Julian had sent his daughter, who remains nameless in Ibn Abd al-Hakam's chronicle, to Ludriq, to Ludriq for education. The king took advantage of the situation and raped her. When Julian learned of this, he said that he could not see another punishment but to send the Arabs upon his king. It was then Julian who became proactive and entered into an alliance with Tariq uh, to provide him with transportation across the straits. This is not the place for an exhaustive genealogy of Count Julian, of this uh, Count Julian tradition in Arabic uh, throughout the centuries, which constitutes a continuous chain of transmission that arguably reached into the 19th and 20th centuries. There is, however, no trace of the name Florinda that Al-Khatib used for Julian's daughter in any other Arabic source that I know of up until the end of the 19th century. Neither does it occur in what was arguably the first rendering of the story as a political activist drama, which is Mustafa Kamil's 1893 play, Fatah al-Andalus. Kamil, who was 19 years old when he wrote the play, is widely considered to be the founder um, of the Egyptian nationalist movement, very important um, figure in modern Egyptian history. But I have no time here to go further into his play. Uh, what I, I would like to say, though, is that Camille only glanced over the Count Julian and Florinda story and did not give a name, did not mention the name Florinda um, for 
uh, the daughter of Count Julian. It is therefore arguable that the name Florinda appeared for the first time in Giorgi Zaidan's 1903 novel, Fatah al-Andalus, which, which was its induction into the realm of Arab nationalist popular culture. The influence of Zaidan as a historian and popularizer um, of history in the Arab, if not broader Muslim world, can hardly be overstated. His historical novels continue to appear in countless new editions until today. They have been translated into languages as far as Indonesian. Reading Zaidan's novels initiated many Arabic speakers to a popular historical consciousness. And some uh, of us who are in this uh, room here today probably also attended a conference that was held in his honor in this very room several weeks ago. And this novel was mentioned too. Durji Zaidan published 21 historical novels between 1891 and his death in 1940, 1914. Fatah al-Andalus presents Zaidan's typical approach to writing history, combining historical accounts with fictional love and suspense stories, all based on meticulous research expressed in numerous footnotes to increase the appearance of scholarly authority and, um, and uh, also adding a bibliography of sources. Zaidan goes a long way to uphold the impression that hardly anything um, in uh, his novels is a matter of mere fiction, including the heroes of the novels. Yet at the same time, um, Fatah al-Andalus is arguably the first appearance of the name Florinda in an Arabic text. Another central element of Zaidan's story is also entirely absent from the tradition in the Arabic language historiography, which is the love story between Florinda, the daughter of uh, Count Julian, and Alphonse, the son of the former Visigothic king Vitica that had been ousted by King Roderick, which was actually a central part of the plot. Zaidan relate on both Arab tradition and numerous Western sources, but he must have taken a great deal of inspiration from the European literary tradition as well, especially Spanish mythology as conferred by romantic poetry, which is a source that he very often used um, for his novels but never um, gave credit to, in his, at least not in this novel. Um, to be sure, Zaidan's novels were no mere translations or compilations of various Arabic or, Europe, or European lines of tradition. He used the historical record to comment on themes that were of a very present concern to him. In contrast to Al-Khatib, the Goths were not vile foreigners to him, but promoters of some sort of liberalism. He came, um, we have to acknowledge, about 30 years before Al-Khatib. He saw some resemblance between the Goths and the Arabs, both of whom had been conquerors of Roman territory, sharing the roughness of a nomadic mentality. The Arabs, however, had managed to build a new civilization on the, ruins, on the ruins of Roman civilization and had turned the nations they subjugated into a single nation with one language, which, had, which the Goths had never managed. This appeal to civilizational unity based on a shared language, which was also a reassurance that Arab Muslim civilization was stronger than that of the Goths. Both those shared the legacy of Roman civilization, which in turn also bound them to Europe. The mistake of the Goths, as Zaidan emphasized, was that they had not been able to control Roman or um, we could say Western cultural hegemony. In the novel, Bishop Opaz, who is Alphonse's uncle, personifies this conflict. He is an example of integrity, but also a dissident who gets into serious conflict with King Roderick. In one scene, Opas laments uh, that the shift from Arianism to Catholicism as the official religion of the kingdom of the Visigoths brought about the loss of unity. Under Arianism, there had been a separation of church and state which Catholicism no longer respected. Altogether, Arianism had been closer to reason than all other Christian religions, according to Zaidan. With Opaz as a mouthpiece, Zaidan argued for Ottoman imperial unity, based on a common civilization, which was in turn based on religion, moderated by reason. The second bond for a community, however, was language, which was closely connected to religion. And for Opaz, um, the adoption of Catholicism, and thus the growing influence of the Romans among the bishops, um, had resulted in a loss of importance for the Gothic language. In this discussion, Zaidan expressed once more the arguably 
uneasy coexistence between loyalty to the state, which was for Zaidan the Ottoman Empire, based on inherited bonds of religion, um, which he as a Christian author accepted, combined with a strong sense for a civilizational unity that added language to religious heritage. And for Zaidan, this was without a doubt the Arabic language. Zaidan's adaptation of European literary topoi provided arguments in domestic, intellectual, and political debates, and, and those debates of his Ottoman Arab environment. Zaidan was certainly familiar with the Arabic tradition of the conquest of Al-Andalus, yet his set of characters relies heavily on a parallel European line of tradition that developed throughout the Middle Ages until the 20th century. Indeed, it has been argued that the story of the conquest of Al-Andalus, and in particular the part of it that evolves around King Roderick, Count Julian, and his daughter Florinda, constitute a foundational myth and lead topos of the literature of the modern Spanish nation, the myth of La Cava, or in another name, Florinda, and her illicit relationship with King Roderick, the Spanish Rodrigo, which is a story of seduction, sexual morality, and the correlation between individual misbehavior and the larger dynamics of fate and providence. For Arab Muslim chroniclers, the conquest of Al-Andalus was but one story in a long line of glorious conquests and triumphs um, over Christianity. And the story of the rape of Count Julian's daughter fulfilled the narrative function to vilify and denigrate the opponents as morally corrupt. For Christian authors, it was exactly the other way around. Roderick's rape became one of the most persistent literary motifs of Christian Spanish literature because it provided an explanation for the catastrophe of the Muslim conquest as a punishment from God. It came up for the first time in Latin chronicles of the 11th century and then moved into um, versions in the Spanish vernacular in the 13th century. The names in this, that are support, so important in this line of traditions, first um, La Cava came up um, in, uh, in the medieval period too, first as um, a La Cava, which later turned into La Cava, and then uh, in the uh, 16th century uh, with the book La Verdadera Historia del Rey Don Rodrigo by Miguel uh, de Luna, who introduced the name Florinda. And so it is probably his brainchild, the name Florinda. In the further course of the transmission of this um, mythology, uh, which then spread um, into the an, entire European realm as a, as a um, material for literary production, um, in, so in the, in the further distribution of this myth, Arabs and Berbers ceased to play a significant role, if not a role at all. The story became rather a, a, an example or, or a symbol for the consequence of lust and um, lack of virtue. Um, it uh, appeared in Spanish ballads and romanceros of the 18th and 17th century. Um, Lope de Vega brought it to the stage and um, for in, in, the, in the 17th century, the English dramatist William Rowley um, rendered, in, rendered it into his play, All's Lost by Lust. George Frederick Handel, the composer, um, turned the Florinda and Roderick myth into his early opera, Rodrigo, which was first performed in Florence in 1707. Handel's version is based on a libretto uh, by Francesco Silvani, which lacks all references to Muslims or their conquest of Spain. While thus an almost unrecognizable version of the myth of the conquest of Al-Andalus had entered the European canon of the arts, it is more likely that Giorgi Zaidan actually took his inspiration from works um, by English Romantic poets, such as Walter Scott, Walter Savage Lander, and Robert Southey, who wrote about the myth in the early 19th century. There are many more references that I cannot go into here. Um, I would just mention 20th century, century Spanish novelist and Islamophile uh, Juan Goitisolo, or a um, musical production that uh, was put on stage in uh, London in 2000 based on a 1977 novel and script by Dana Broccoli, who was actually the wife of James Bond film producer Albert R. Broccoli. One would be hard pressed to accept the various parallels in narrative lines and names of characters as clear lines of transmission for the various motifs in Zaidan's novel. At the end of the day, Zaidan's novel remains a fictional account in which several sources that he used as, that he used as inspiration flow together. Had he relied slavishly on his sources, the novel would have become a much less compelling story. 
it is nevertheless, nevertheless highly arguable that Fatah al-Andalus became the urtext of the modern day standard storyline of the conquest of al-Andalus myth. Most contemporary Arab renderings of the story concentrate on Tarit ibn Ziyad as one of the great heroes of Islamic history. Plays with al-Andalus references were popular on stages throughout the Arab world in the interwar period. And books for, for youth um, present Tariq ibn Ziyad as one of varied, various Arab and Muslim heroes today. And the appearances of Florinda and Count Julian are ubiquitous in these novels. There's also another example, which I unfortunately won't have the time to go into in depth here, which is a, which is a, a cartoon film that uh, came, uh, that was produced um, in Saudi Arabia, probably in the 1990s or 2000s, I could not identify the exact date, and which is basically a rendering of the um, of uh, Georgi Zaidan's novel in, in film. Uh, to conclude, literature and poetry are only one facet of the construction of Al-Andalus as a collective Arab realm of memory. It signifies a glorious past of harmony and wisdom, but also the superiority of civilization. Lines of tra transmission of individual topoi in this mythology remain hard to trace but Zaydan's work evidently functioned like a focal lens of several lines of tradition from various origins, bringing together motifs from Arabic and European historiography and literary history, thus highlighting the transnational nature of nationalist narrative lines. Zaydan introduced the Florinda Roderick motif not only as an adoption, but as a radical adaptation of the European myth to the discursive context of the late Ottoman Empire. As a historicist, Zaidan used the material of the story to reconcile the growing Arab cultural awareness of his milieu with his own location as a Christian in a Muslim majority environment. Questions of loyalty, even to a dictatorial monarch, and the advantages of a morally superior Arab Muslim ruler are at the heart of Zaidan's version of the novel. Yet he also argued for a secular state when he propagated the division of church and state. All these aspects mark this novel as a literary work of the Arab revival period, the Nahda, or in other words, of proto-nationalism. Thank you very much. So, ready to take some questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Yeah, yes, please. I don't know of any utopias. Okay. Okay. I mean, well, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, not it's, a, it's a very popular topic in um, modern day um, Arabic poetry still. Okay. And um, many of the modern Arab poets, Mahmoud Darwish, um, Adunis, and, and, and uh, people of, of, of this kind, um, use it as a, as a topos, as a reference, but without any historical um, meaning attached to it. But it, is, it comes up as, a, as an image, as something that to some extent probably represents a, a utopia rather than, a, than an, an image projected into the past. So I think um, uh, it's probably sometimes hard to make a distinction oh, between... That's between, yeah. verse. That's verse, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So I don't know of any narrative. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you mean Arab nationalist projects of various Arab states? 
Um, the, the argument that I'm making is that um, Al-Andalus is, as a cultural reference, is a reference that all Arabs share. So it makes, or it triggers certain feelings um, and a certain nostalgia among Arabs from Morocco to um, Iraq, um, which is why it is, so, why it is such a powerful topos. The, the various manifestations in different countries then maybe of a very different kind. Um, you know, Al-Andalus means something very different for Moroccans than, for instance, for Palestinians or for Syrians who use it pretty much in the sense as, as I've been describing it, you know, the, the, as, a, as a symbol of a, of a possible um, future of, of grandeur, you know, a, a redemptive um, story. Whereas uh, for Moroccans nowadays, it, ha it has a much more concrete meaning because they, um, for instance, you find uh, in Morocco many um, families of high standing who trace back their origin to families um, in, uh, in, in Muslim Spain. And this is probably actually really a, 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 um, a concrete line which they can trace back to families that once, that during the, that after the Reconquista came to Morocco. And for them to consider themselves as Spanish is very important as part of their identity, which then is not an identity that becomes a, an, an element of a general Moroccan or Arab identity, but it sets them apart from the rest of the society. So to be um, an Andalusian in Morocco means that you have a certain um, uh, standing in, in Moroccan society. Um, so it adds to your, to your position in society. Um, you know, there are also these, these examples of, of uh, families who still carry the keys of the houses they left. I mean, that's, it's, I don't know to what extent this mythology are actually concrete. Um, so in the, the manifestations on the ground, the kind of political um, and social meanings that people attach to it, when they hear these stories, when they hear the poet, poetry and so on, they are, pro they are um, obviously very different according to the location that you're in. But the myth as such, um, is one that I would identify as a shared myth that has um, um, value and importance for all people who consider themselves part of, of or belonging to Arab culture. Yes, please. The, the mosque in Cordoba, okay. Okay, that's, I can go back to my, to my wonderful images. So the mosque, you see the, you know, this is the floor plan of the mosque in Cordoba. You know, the mosque in Cordoba today is the, is the cathedral um, of Cordoba. So it's one of the, of the outstanding um, churches in Spain. And actually the, um, the, uh, the, the conqueror of Cordoba um, decided to maintain the cathedral, um, the, the mosque in, 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 the, in, the, in the state that it was in when it was conquered. He only, they only put um, a nave um, in the, right in the center um, of, the, of the prayer hall of the Mosque of Cordoba. So it's a, it's kind of an, it's a very intricate uh, mixture and combination of, of you know, the old structure of the mosque with, um, uh, with a um, Gothic um, structure, um, a church nave um, towering in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Okay, the Jewish topic is a very important one, which is, and I chose not to include it here just for the sake of, you know, it would have become a, a much larger presentation. Jews play a very important role in, um, in Georgi Zaidan's novel, and they play an important role 
in uh, Fuad al Khatib's play. And uh, they do so in very different ways. Uh, in Jurji Zaidan's novel, they are um, allies of the Muslims. So they represent um, the part of the story of the topos that is related to um, Islamic rule as being beneficial to um, other religions, to so-called dhimmi people, the people who are protected, the religions that are protected under the rule of Islam, which is why um, Zaidan introduces a Jewish conspiracy in, that, um, in his novel, which um, works against King Roderick and which, which works in favor of, um, of Alphonse, the, 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 the son of the, of the former King Vititsa, and which also works to bring in the Muslims as, um, as future rulers of Spain. You can definitely identify certain traces of um, anti-Semitic stereotypes and the fact that there is a conspiracy, you know. But it is very different from the way how um, Jews and the role of Jews in this is then portrayed later in, uh, and especially in the, in the, in the uh, play by Fuad al-Khatib where the, the, the Jews are basically given a, a negative role. So you see Zaidan writes in 1903 and the Ottoman Empire um, is, is an empire that you know, expects to, to um, exist forever. You know? In 1903, they don't know that it falls in 1918. You know? So they expect that it exists forever, and the people um, built an, a, a, uh, an ethos around Ottoman rule, which is precisely about convivencia. It's, it's precisely about living together, and the, and the, the Muslim ruler, the sultan and caliph, um, providing uh, protection to um, Christians and to Jews in, um, uh, in, in, you know, under the umbrella of the empire. Whereas in 1931, uh, when Fadel al Khatib writes, he writes in the context of the Palestine conflict, you know, the major topic of Arab nationalism um, at the time, two years after the so-called Wailing Wall incident, which is one of the major um, um, you know, flaring, it's, which is a flaring up of the, um, of the violent conflict between Arabs and Jews um, in Palestine. So there are two very different contexts which provide very different um, outcomes here. Now the second part of the question um, would actually, I, I would give the same answer as the one that I gave before. You know, there, is, there are certain um, parts of the Arab world, and these are pr precisely or mostly Tunisia and Morocco, in which um, Andalusian um, heritage, which can be traced back through very concrete family links, family links to Andalusia, play a very important role. So there's there's the, the direct link um, to the places where people used to live, but there's also the link of, of Andalusian music, which is so important, especially in the context of Morocco, where Andalusian music is one of the major um, cultural markers that also the, the um, monarchy, the Moroccan monarchy uses in order to um, you know, um, create this bond of longevity between the population and the past of, of, of Moroccan glory. Um, yeah, so much for that. Sure. There is none. Oh yeah. So. I still have to look at textbooks. I haven't done that yet. And I'm actually looking forward to, to seeing to what extent you know, names come up, like, like Count Julian or Florinda, which have, have nothing to do with the, the Arabic tradition, but really come, you know, I think it's, clear, it's clearly identifiable that they come from, from a European tradition through Saidan. Um, what I can say is that there is a whole range of, of um, novels for, for young people um, that um, are clearly simply rewrites of Zaidan's novel. I think it is enormously important um, as, a, as a trigger of a particular um, kind of historical consciousness in, through a particular storyline. Um, and again, I wouldn't be surprised if I would find the same storyline also in, 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 in modern textbooks. You know, it's a mixture probably. You know, Zaidan's novel is a mixture. 
Now, it's a, mix, it's a mixture between, uh, between um, Arabic tradition, al-Maqari, and so on, that he, that he cites in his, in his book, and um, other elements that he takes in, which I say are inspired by European literature. And in the same sense, uh, I wouldn't be surprised to find in, in uh, textbooks um, for, for Arab um, students similar lines, um, similar storylines that are told. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.